So I went and bought a book on physics, and I started reading on quantum physics and string theory and theory of relativity and Albert Einstein, and some of this stuff is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Um, but as I'm reading it, I'm just like fascinated at the, at the different levels. And so Matt Shively, one of our pastors, walked into my office, and one of my physics books <laughs> was sitting on my desk, and he's like, why do you have this book? Where's your comics? I'm like, no, this, this is my book. He's like, why are you reading this? And I start explaining to him. And he looks at me, and he's like, what happened to you? I said, well, you, th- you think about it, the bigness and the hugeness of the universe, it's, all, it's amazing to me. And he goes, there you are. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, bigness and hugeness, those aren't words. <laughs> I'm like, all right, sure, whatever. Uh, so if you look at wisdom, though, uh, if you look at man's version of wisdom and God's ver- version of wisdom, sometimes those two things are drastically different. We do get our wisdom from God. But then man has a tendency sometimes to run on its own with that definition of wisdom and what it means. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, you see one of the oldest teachings in Jewish scripture on what wisdom is. And it simply says, a good name is more desirable than great riches. Now, if you read that, you may not think there's wisdom in that statement. But when it says a good name, like when you think about that statement right there, And if you think of your name, and you shouldn't have to think about it, you should just know it, but if you think of your name or you think of a name of a person around you, something else is associated with that. You see, because a name tells a story. It's your reputation. If you think about who you are, it's built up of all of your experiences, all of your conversations, your decisions, your relationships, your work. All of these factors come in to make you who you are. And so when your name is spoken, when it's said, and those people that are around you that either know you or have heard of you, they instantly go to a place in their mind that describes you. And that could be your name, it could be your nickname. All of those things describe who you are. There's a kid in high school, and he's the only one that gave me this name. He called me Gunthar the Space Warrior. And I tried to always think, like, what does that describe? Like, where did he get that from? There was never any meat to that one. But generally, your nickname or your name tells a story. The question is, what is that story? Like, when your name is spoken, what is the, what is the story that's telling people? You thought, I thought about myself, and I thought about who I was, and there was a time in my life where I really had to really take a step back and begin to ask, who, like, who am I? Like, what is Paul about? What is, what is this? You know, what is my story? What are, what are the things that when someone speaks my name that they think of? And I think we all go to a place in pride first. When we get to the end of our life and we're like, well, we want our names to be great. We want to be remembered. Everyone wants to be remembered But I really began asking God, like, what do you want with me? But then more so as I took a step back, I asked the question, God, do you even know me? Like, do you know my name? Because you seem pretty quiet. And there was these seasons that I went through, and they were all connected to each other, where I was constantly coming back to, God, are you even there? Do you even know my name? And so I asked, and I asked, and I asked, and I kept coming to this place of, God, do you know me? You know, I started reading scripture and started looking at more of what it means to be filled with wisdom. And I started studying lives of people that were like these great Christians. And as I read and studied, I realized that oftentimes you would see these stories of these great leaders of the past or currently who had these moments where they said, I just can't really explain it, but I knew that God was calling us forward. And so we went without an agenda, without a plan. You know, ultimately, I had to take a step back, and I had to ask the question, can I trust my name? Or can I trust my story with God's wisdom? Like, I, can I get to a place in my life where I can ultimately say, God, my name, my story, this, this is yours, and I'm going to trust you in your wisdom? I then had to even go to the place of, is it possible? Like, is it honestly possible for someone like me to be filled with wisdom? You know, there's a verse, James 1.5. It simply says this, 
It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And I remember reading that and going, that's pretty simple. If you lack wisdom, ask God. So I began to ask God, God, can you fill me with wisdom? Can you make my name about you? Can you make my decisions? You see, I knew who God was. I went to church all the time. I, I knew my scriptures. I knew how to pray out loud so people went, wow, he's, he's pretty well together, put well together. But I sat there and I, I still asked the question, do you, do you know me? Like, how do I go from being this casual Christian to in this deep, intimate relationship with this God who created me? God, give me wisdom. You know, there's probably hasn't been a day that has gone by that I haven't stopped multiple times to say, God, I'm praying in this moment. I pray for my kid. I pray, I pray that you'll give me wisdom on how to make it through this next phase. God, give me wisdom. You know, if you look up wisdom in the dictionary, it's interesting. Webster's definition of wisdom says knowledge of what is proper or reasonable, good sense or judgment. Now, when I read that, for me, and I look at that relationship between James 1, where you ask God for wisdom, when it says what is proper or reasonable or good sense or judgment, I, I don't know if that's what James was talking about. When he says, ask God for wisdom, I don't think he's asking me for good sense. Now, is there a place in Scripture for good sense a reasonable judgment? Absolutely, 100%. But... When I look at living my life that's filled with God's wisdom, for me, I look at how Jesus lived. And one of the things that he said over and over and over again was to abandon everything and follow him. And then you look at what he told people to do and how he lived his life. He walked on water. He told Peter to get out of the boat and walk with him. He fed the 5,000. He chose a bunch of fishermen to be his disciples is that using good sense or good judgment? From a worldly perspective, no, that's not. That's, he went off the grid. For me, as I look at it, though, you look at how Jesus lived, and his life was revolutionary. It was radical. It was this unexplainable life. You know, for us and who we are, what is proper or done with good sense in our minds directly correlates with safety and security. And because of this, our spiritual lives are filled with nice, safe boundaries, and we use good sense when we seek out His will. But what happens then is this, this current of God's amazing plan for us keeps flying by us, and we stand there because we're too filled with good judgment to jump in. When you look at who we are and how we were created, you look at your name. You come back to that first step. A name is just more than what you're called. It's your identity. It tells people your story. Even if you go into scriptures and you look at God, you start with that. He had names that were given to him and names that he gave himself. You look at Hagar. She's lost in the desert and she's out there. And finally God comes to her and she says to him, she says, you are the God who sees Abraham is out getting ready to sacrifice his son, one of the more bizarre stories in the Bible. And then God sends a ram. Abraham says to him, you are the God who provides. Moses goes to a burning bush, and, he, and, and, and God is speaking to him, and he says, who are you? Who do I say you are? He says, tell them I am. Moses then goes, could you like, go into a little bit more description so I can explain that a little easier? He says, I am the God of your fathers. In other words, I've always been the same and I always will be. I'm the same God for you as I was for your fathers and for your children and your children's children. This same story will continue. My same name, it doesn't change. Even Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, he's with his disciples. And Jesus asks his disciples, he says to them, he says, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They answered with names of John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He then said to them, what about you? Who do you say I am? In other words, what is my name? 
Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then goes on in verse 21, it says this, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap for me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Moments before, Peter gives him the name Messiah, which means the Savior, the King, the promised and expected Savior. You gave him this highest honor. And then he pulls him aside and says, look, what's wrong with you? Like, where did all your wisdom go? Because now you're spitting out all this nonsense And that has no place. Jesus then beautifully looks at him and says, get behind behind me, Satan. Go away. You have no understanding what you're talking about. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. I read that years ago. I realized that my good name would only come if I could figure out how to see wisdom from God's point of view instead of man's. You see, in the wisdom teachings for the Jewish people, a good name had so much power. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1, it says this. It says, a good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. And you look at that and compare it with the Proverbs 22. A good name, according to the Jewish Wisdom writers, this is what they said, a good name is one of wisdom's highest prizes because it describes trustworthiness, gratitude, and a lifetime of living out the scriptures. It isn't possible to buy or even inherit a good name. It's not a right, but a gift offered on a daily basis of a lengthy history of reliable contributions to the lives of others. It's about the life patterns, relationships, words, and actions. So when it says a good name is more desirable than great riches, there's so much wisdom behind it. Because for me, if I think about my name, my story, who I am as a person, if I'm going to follow this teaching, then my name should reflect his name. And my story should reflect his story. And that's all fine and dandy, but then at some point you have to step back and you have to ask the question, how? Like, how do I get to that place? So we tell you, read Proverbs as a church. Let's go through that together. Let's read it each day. Should we do that? Absolutely. But let's be honest. Sometimes it's like drinking out of a fire hose. Because there's just so much wisdom in some of these passages. And that's kind of the point when you think about it. To slow down and be still and to read it and and go through that with other people. And ask the questions on faith. You know, we gather every Sunday. We come in this room and we sit and we sing and we listen. And we try to be filled with wisdom. So that we can go out on our week and change the world maybe. So for me, ultimately, I have to again come back to Jesus and look at how did he live with wisdom. I like to sometimes look at his disciples because they're human, fully human, and I can relate a little bit more with them. But I even look at how when they first began to follow Jesus, you see, before he said, drop everything and follow me, they knew who he was. They had heard his teachings. They had heard him speaking. They had watched him living. They had observed, but they just stood there for a while and watched. There became this moment where Jesus walks up to them and he says, drop your nets, leave your career, leave everything that you know, and follow me. Now, if you go to man's version of wisdom, knowledge of what is proper or reasonable, showing good sense or judgment, 
Well, if you're an observer watching that, and, and, and Jesus says, leave everything, leave your career, leave everything you know and follow. The disciples had that moment where they had to decide, am I going to stand on the sidelines or am I going to go all in? Am I going to take this? Am I just going to see what happens? I love that they drop everything and follow. The second definition of wisdom in Webster's Dictionary says the natural ability to understand things that most other people cannot understand. I don't know if you've ever had those moments in your relationship with God where you felt like he was speaking to you, where he was calling you forward. As a missions pastor, I get this about on 50% of every single person that goes on a missions trip with me. They come to me at some point and they say, hey, you know, I really want to go and I feel like God's leading me, but my family is telling me this is a bad idea. And my friends are asking me, why in the world would I ever go to Africa? And people are really kind of questioning me and doubting me. And my response is always, it's because they're looking at it from man's point of view instead of God's point of view. You can sit there and you can go with it and be scared. Or you can just say, you know what, I feel like God is calling me. You know, it's like God speaks to us. It's like he's screaming at us. Look, you have been doing your life your way for so long. How about you try it my way? How about you just give up everything and abandon it all and try it my way? In Proverbs chapter 22, a good name is more desirable than great riches. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. And then it says, pay attention. Turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips so that your trust may be in the Lord. The question then is, can you trust God with all of your life? Can you trust, honestly, if you're going to ask the question, can you trust God with your life? As North American Christians, we like to know what is next and then explain how it will happen. We like comfort and security and savings accounts and five-year plans and forecasting models that say everything is going to be fine. The problem with that is we're seeing it from a human perspective instead of God's. You know, sometimes doing things God's way doesn't fully make sense. And God's wisdom oftentimes seems foolish to those that don't fully understand who he is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says this. It says, the teachings about the cross seems foolish to those who are lost. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Brothers and sisters, God chose you to be his. Think about that. Not many of you were wise in the way of the world judges wisdom. Not many of you came from important families. It is God who has made you part of Christ Jesus. And Christ has become for us wisdom from God. He is the reason that we are right with God. I'm okay in a place in my life when I feel like God is leading me. And I get to a place where I have to answer or describe this to somebody. I'm okay saying, you know what? I don't know. I don't, I don't fully know, but I know that God is leading me and guiding me, and I'm going to choose his wisdom. That James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. If you lack wisdom, and that's not just a one-time question, that is a daily conversational thing. God, I, I feel like right now I need your wisdom. Ask. It's not that hard to figure out. James 1, then goes on to say this, do not merely listen to the word, word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. You see, we have all these questions on, I'm not sure what to do. Well, if you think about it, it's not about what you know. It's about what you do. It's about how you live. It's about your name. And that becomes uncomfortable, because at some point you have to shift from explaining everything from man's perspective to God's perspective. Last week, if you weren't here, Nate uh, gave a sermon that was brilliant. He spoke on pride and humility, and if you weren't here, you need to go and watch the podcast. But as I'm sitting there listening to him, if you weren't here, he tells part of his story. Uh, and part of his story is the fact that when he was born, his mom 
was a drug addict, and, and he went through life with his mom being addicted to drugs. He went through life with a dad that said, I don't want to be a part of this, and was absent. He bounced from home to home to home, moving from family to family and friend to friend, and eventually by the time he was a junior, he moved in with his friend's family and lived there. You know, as we were talking, Nate and I, uh, I get the blessing of meeting with him every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, and I get to serve as one of his mentors. And as we sit and talk about faith, uh, one of the things I've asked him multiple times is, Nate, how did you, how'd you get to this place? Because honestly, from a world's perspective, you should be a bank robber or a drug addict or in jail. I mean, let's just call it. He goes, yeah. He goes, I should have. I said, how did you end up here? Like, how did you end up in this place? He goes, I realized young that God had so much in store for my life. And I could choose to pursue that. Or I could choose to deal with the hand that life gave me. I hear and I've given excuse after excuse after excuse on why I can't take this next step in faith or why we can't go to this next place because of this, because of that. God's wisdom, man's wisdom. And this calling on our life that is so strong. If you go back to that, pay attention, turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Pay attention. We have now just entered into a Pokemon generation. <laughs> there are people randomly walking around like this, and it makes no sense. There was a video this last week of a guy who was in New York City, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people behind him, and they're all going like this. He goes, watch this. I'm going to yell that there's a rare Pokemon here, which I didn't fully know that there are, and I would yell you a name, but I don't know any others besides Pokemon. And so he stood there with his phone, and you could see all the people behind him. He started screaming this rare Pokemon. And hundreds of people just started running. It's as if he was going to get ran over. He sat there, and you're watching him, and then he just goes, <laughs> and walks away. <laughs> and in the video, you can see all these people like frantically looking for nothing. Now, is Pokemon wrong? No. Is it a waste of time? Potentially, Yes. I had a pastor tell me that sometimes things that aren't wrong are wrong. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, if this is taking you away from your time with Jesus, that's wrong. If you're spending and obsessing too much time with this, it's wrong. If it's pulling you even slightly away from Jesus, it's wrong. It says pay attention. In other words, be intentional. God's wisdom, you don't just get to ask. I mean, you do. But then you have to use your wisdom and continue to work and go deeper in his teachings. It then says this, apply your heart to what I teach. The early reader would have read that and said, the early, it would have said, apply your heart to what I teach. It would have said, apply this to your guts. Like that really meant your innermost beings at the center, at your core, at the farthest depths. Apply it to that place because that's where you hide your junk. That's where you try to tell people, I, I, I don't want you to know about this. And it says here, apply it to your depths, to the, to the farthest places that you can imagine, so that your trust may be in the Lord. So the question then back to, can you trust God with your life, is more so, it's can you trust God with all of your life, not just portions, all. You know, it goes in Proverbs chapter 3, Verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. And your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. It's one of the most quoted passages in Proverbs. One of the things I read this week, it says, These verses are to Christians what the wedding ceremony is to newlyweds. They say this is the to have and to hold from this day forward passage. It's the passage that when you read it, you can either say, I do or I don't. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways submit to him. But you see, that's kind of a big, scary thing to say. And if you're like me, weddings, honestly, they scare me a little bit. I just have, it's a strange thing to be afraid of, but they strike fear in my life. As a pastor, people ask me to marry them, and my response is always the same, no. <laughs> Why? I'm going to be out of the country. No, you're not. I'm pregnant. I can't. I'm sorry. 
Like, it doesn't matter the excuse, I'll come up with it. Because it's just, I always screw them up. Like, I don't know if it's because I can't stay on script, I don't know what it is, but it's this couple's one moment in their entire life and then I make a mess of it, so I'd rather just not be involved. And if I've ever offended you by saying no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> if you don't believe me, recently, two, three weeks ago, Ray and Amber, Amber who runs our coffee shop, they asked me to marry them. They've been asking for months and I kept saying no. And about a week before, they're like, you're doing the wedding, right? And I said, no, I told you, I'm not doing it. Okay, it starts at 10. <laughs> what part of that don't you understand? And I told him, I'll, I'll make a mess of this. No, you won't, you'll be fine. Last line that I had to say as I stood before them and they stood here and the, the people, the witnesses are out there, I had to say it is with great pleasure I now introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. Raymond Masters. I stood before them and I said, it is with great pressure that I now... <laughs> and I didn't like say, pleasure or pleasure. I said, pressure. Like, full-on committed. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I went, I, said, I just said pressure. And then I was like, what do you do? Do you take it back? You can't take anything back in a wedding. You're already all in. So I just went with it. I'm like, well, let's be honest. It's true. It's like, there's a lot of pressure. Good luck with your life. I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, I, I look at that, and I'm like, what in the world? You look at these verses, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Yeah, but what if I make a mess of it? Like, what if I can't do this? Like, what if, like, like something goes wrong? What if I have moments of weakness? What if, what if? You have this phrase right here that, in a sense, is a path to wisdom, but we get stuck in the, yeah, but what if? I let man's wisdom come in instead of trusting God's wisdom. There's a quote that's in your handout by a guy named David Hubbard. It says, trust steps onto the bridge of God's loving power and leaves the shoreline of our own abilities and ambitions behind. Such belief means literally to bet your life on God's truth and wisdom. Somebody with my personality, I read, bet your life on his truth and wisdom, I'm down with that. Like, that's something that gets me fired up. But then we look at all these different things when it says, can you trust God with all of your life? All, can you submit completely to his wisdom? In other words, can I give up my finances? Can I trust him with my kids? Can I trust him with my spouse, my relationships, my insecurities, those things that I hide deep within who I am? Can I trust that God is bigger than all that? Who we are right now, a lot of us are struggling with, can I trust him with these candidates, with these elections, with these people that think differently than me? You know, I was watching a, a video this week by Andy Stanley. He's a pastor in Atlanta and a writer. He's a brilliant communicator. So he has a two-minute clip on this. And instead of me sharing it, I figure he's way smarter than me. So watch this two-minute clip from Andy Stanley. Yeah. Real quick, I want to say something to a couple groups, all right? First, I want to say something to all of you who are 45 years old and older. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? 45 and older. Look up here. Many of you have grown weary and you've lost heart. And the reason is because you have fixed your eyes on a political system, you have fixed your eyes on a political leader, you have fixed your eyes on the good old days, you fixed your eyes on the economy, and you are, you are growing weary, and you need to knock it off. And I'll tell you why. Because you are scaring the children. <laughs> you are. Now look up here, look, look. The generation that's coming along behind us are gonna take their cue from us, and here's the cue we're giving them. Oh my goodness, if we don't get the right person in the, in the, you know, elected in office, it's the end of the world. If we don't fix the economy, it's the end of the world. If we don't have religious freedom like my mama and my grandmama had religious freedom, it's the end of the world. Oh my goodness, if we don't get the right laws passed, if we don't have the right policies, it's all coming unraveled. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look up here. Government, and po government matters, policies matter, but neither of those matter as much as men and women who understand this word, faith. 
confidence that God keeps his promises and that nothing can thwart the plans of God. We know this from the Old Testament. We know this from the New Testament. We know this because the most powerful person in Judea, Pilate, looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? Crucify him, game over, it's done, let's move on. And the only reason you know who Pilate is The only reason you know who Pilate is is because you know the story of Jesus. Pilate, the governor, becomes a footnote in the story of Jesus. In fact, most of the first century people you know about, you know about because they're part of the story of Jesus. We have nothing to fear. So all of you people over 45, knock it off. You need to model for the next generation that God is in control, God can be trusted, get involved in the political system, get involved in culture, get involved in your society, but you never fix your eyes there, you fix your eyes on Jesus. You know, when you begin to pursue God's wisdom, and place that into your life on a, on a regular basis, you don't always get what you want. It doesn't always work out, but the question is, can we trust God's wisdom is ultimately all that we need. The third definition of wisdom, according to Webster's Dictionary, is knowledge that is gained by having many experiences in life. And as you begin to walk deeper and further with Christ, you begin to trust him more and more and more. In James chapter 3, it says this in verse 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. If you think of that last section, what if daily we were asking ourselves, Am I being peace-loving? Am I being considerate? Am I being submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere? What if your Facebook feed just was filled with that? What if we began to shift these areas in our life to really fully trust that he is in control of our lives? When I go on trips, my kids and my, my wife, they put notes in my, my bag. Uh, and I found this one recently. It's from my daughter, Emma. And, and she wrote it probably five or six years ago. Uh, And I have a bag that's constantly ready to go, and it was buried in there, and I've read it over the years, but I read it again while I was in Malawi, and it's Proverbs 2, 7, and 8, and it says this, and this is, she wrote it out, and this is all it says, he holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield for those whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. And then she wrote on the back of it, she wrote, You are faithful, and he will protect you while you are gone. And I was thinking about my name and my story and what God has called me to do with my life. And it gives me such amazing joy to know that my daughter gets it. She knows my name. She understands what it means. But she also understands that we are called to be faithful. See, ultimately, it's about his wisdom, not ours. It's about his timeline, not mine. There's a song the band is going to sing that says, Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things, be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. Your name can tell God's story. Your life can be filled with God's wisdom. But you have to be intentional. And you have to choose. And I, am I going to live a life that pursues man's wisdom? Or am I going to turn and say, you know what? I trust you with all areas of my life. And I'm going to pursue God's wisdom.